Okay, I think we're going to get started. I am Samantha Davis. I'm the virtual legal advocate at Rise Women's Legal Center. Um, we've got Rosanna here. Um, I'm a lawyer at Rise and I provide summary advice. Um, we're going to be talking to you about property law issues today. Um, it's going to go over um, some Supreme Court stuff, but also um, I'll talk a little bit briefly about separation agreements. Um, so at any point, feel free to interrupt, um, put your hand up, add comments. I think we do need to pass the mic around because there's online participants that we'll need to be able to hear. Um, and we will post the slides as well. Um, as always, um, when you hear us do a presentation at RISE, uh, our big disclaimer, nothing in this uh, presentation is legal advice. If you need legal advice, please uh, contact a lawyer. Um, another thing that I always say, because sometimes people get confused, RISE is not affiliated with Legal Aid at all. Uh, we help doing uh, a lot of Legal Aid applications and stuff, but we are not the same at all. Um, so in terms of our agenda for today, we're gonna do some Property 101. Um, and then I'm going to kind of go over who can do what in the province um, as it relates to property law. Um, there's some differences with my role from other people's roles in the province um, that are important to highlight. Then we're going to talk um, about some more specific special issues. And then hopefully we'll have time for questions. Um, so yeah, jump in at any time. Um, but I will let Rosanna take it over. Okay, um, so to start off today, uh, what is property law? Um, property law has a lot of fields in which it comes up, but in the context of family law, it's primarily uh, talking about who gets what when two spouses separate. Um, there are other places property law can come up in family law. For example, we can talk about enforcing agreements, um, or we can talk about before people separate, we can have cohabitation or marriage agreements, which determine rights at the end of a relationship. So um, the rules for property law come from a few places. Notably, the Family Law Act is our starting point. So most of it is found in part five and part six of the Family Law Act, but throughout um, the act, there are different pieces that apply. Part five talks about the division of property and part six talks about pensions specifically. Um, I'll highlight that pensions have their own part. Pensions are scary. Um, they involve a lot of liability to be involved with. Um, and I suspect um, most of the time, if a client has a pension, they'll fall outside of your scope of practice as a law foundation advocate because of their valuable nature. Um, so I just highlight that. Um, the next set of rules are the Supreme Court family rules. So family law, uh, property and family law is dealt with in Supreme Court. We're not in provincial court. So we're dealing with the Supreme Court rules. Um, these are the two main pieces of legislation that you would be working with, but property law um, spans a lot of areas. So you may have to think about issues like tax, corporations, uh, property ownership. So for example, later on, we're gonna talk about the Land Spouse Protection Act, um, which is a separate act, which commonly will come up in family law cases. So our property cases have um, kind of three different paths that we can talk about. The first one is through Supreme Court. So this is your traditional litigation file. So um, someone that's going to court and they're seeking orders. The second path um, that we talk about is mediation, negotiation, or arbitration. So this is settling a matter outside of court. Um, and this is how many property issues will be solved. Um, the final path I have here is waiting. Um, I'd say this is probably actually where most files go. And most files, people do not deal with their property issues for a variety of reasons and um, they just wait their limitation periods out. So the results, um, if you're in Supreme Court, we're looking at orders. If you're in uh, negotiation, mediation or arbitration, we're looking at written agreements. Um, and then if you're waiting the status quo, so what's happening um, is normally the result. Um, the goals of property, family property law, uh, 
is maybe a bit more of a theoretical question. From my perspective as a lawyer, what I'm often looking for is to ensure that property is divided in accordance to the Family Law Act. So um, some people will disagree, uh, but this is typically what I would maybe consider to be fair. Um, clients often have other goals other than division. They're not thinking about the issue in terms of division in line with the Family Law Act. So someone may be trying to protect a specific asset. So for example, someone may want to stay in the family home. Um, they may want to avoid conflict, which is often where we get sticking to the status quo and waiting to address the legal issue. Um, and then often clients are focused on ensuring their financial security. Often um, one of the things we come across are clients focusing on their current or their short-term financial security um, and not necessarily their long-term financial security. I don't say that to blame or say that's a bad thing, but that's um, one of the, there's many reasons that happens. And I think the role of an advocate can often be to encourage our clients to think about the longer term uh, piece of family law. So the Family Law Act is the main piece of legislation. As I said, it deals with property um, and pension division. It applies both to married and common law spouses. Um, common law spouses are spouses that have lived together in a marriage-like relationship for two years. Even if you are not a common law spouse or a married spouse, you may have property obligations to each other. So for example, if two parties are on a lease together, they may have obligations under the Residential Tenancies Act. Um, they may have equitable claims. So those are claims based on common law to each other's property after separation, even in cases where they are not common law or married spouses. Um, that's kind of outside of the scope of our conversation today. If those circumstances come up, I would suggest your client, I mean, if it's a tenancy issue, a uh, tenancy advocate, but if not, um, they may want to seek legal advice. So the Family Law Act does three kind of broad categories of things. The first is it forces parties to uh, have financial disclosure or to make financial disclosure. So um, if you've worked in property law, you will have seen a financial statement, exchanging documents, letting each other know what the financial circumstances are. Um, the second broad category of things the Act does is ensuring that property is preserved um, and property and debt are preserved and they can be fairly used until a division occurs. So uh, here we'd see perhaps a freezing order on an asset or an order saying that somebody can live in the family home or that somebody has to keep paying a utility or a mortgage. And the final section um, is dividing family property and debt, which is most of the work and what we often think about um, the Family Law Act doing. And the Family Law Act provides for how that will happen with orders and how that would happen with an agreement. Um, in situations where two parties are um, in a marriage-like relationship or are considered common law, um, the property, um, once it hits the two-year mark, everything becomes retroactive for the previous two years. So that's something to keep in mind as well. It's not like there's a start date at the two years. Um, and then everything going forward, it does include the, the two years prior. So I've got on the slide four of the key terms in the Family Law Act to keep in mind when we're talking about how property division works. So the first term is family property. So family property refers to the things that, um, the property that we will divide between the two spouses. Family property is anything that has been acquired during the relationship um, and any increase in equity of previously acquired family property or excluded property. So if anybody worked under the Family Relations Act, the way that this definition is new and different than the property definition under the previous act um, is it doesn't talk about the use or the type of property generally, it talks about the dates. So what we're trying to do is capture that everything during the relationship and the increase in value during the relationship is typically family property with some exceptions. I see a hand in the back. Yeah. So he's 50 or $60,000 in debt to CRA. He's paying it off 700 bucks a month. 
he's convinced my client is uh, responsible for half of that debt is, I mean, Yeah, so that's getting a bit into legal advice. So I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen in each specific scenario. But if we look at the next definition, family debt is what's acquired in either party's name. So it doesn't matter whose name it is during the relationship or after the relationship, if incurred to maintain family property. So when I hear that debt question about a CRA debt, um, if it was incurred during the relationship or had to do with... um, time during the relationship, that's likely family debt. If it's incurred after the relationship, we have to look at why it was incurred. Um, But again, there's a lot of it depends. That is a question that legal advice would be needed for, and I'd have to know some more factors. Um, One of the kind of theoretical reasons why that would be family debt, even if it's only in that party's name, um, is if it's to do with the family business, theoretically, uh, the other party's getting a benefit due to the kind of the value of that business, which would also be family property. Um, So circling back to family property, property is basically anything of value. A business can be a value, um, RRSPs, life insurance policies, an expensive bike, a car. Um, Clothing is typically personal property, but if you had clothing of lots of value, that could be family property. Family debt, most debts would fall into that category. See another hand. Maybe if you say the question, I can repeat it and then you don't have to run. That's, yeah. Yeah. So um, the long and short of that is it is in fact complicated. This is one of the things that, um, they are doing, the government is doing a review of the Family Law Act right now, and they're talking about what you're describing, I think, is the presumption of advancement. So it, there is some clarification happening about how property is traced, what's a gift, um, and by property is traced, what I'm saying is if something is excluded property, when does it become not excluded? So we know that the increase in value of excluded property is divisible as family property, Um, But let's say if that excluded property is used to purchase a home, um, does it change value if both people are on title? So typically that excluded property, I think that the starting point is excluded property. So let's say that $50,000 down payment, that equity is still excluded. Um, But there are circumstances where it may not be or things may be different. um, And that's often due to the presumption of advancement, which we do not know if the Family Law Act has gotten rid of it or not. Um, there is case law on both sides, um, which brings me to a point, property law is very complex. I've had some very basic definitions up here, but as you can see, there's a lot of questions already. Um, so this is one of the areas where it's very important for your client to get legal advice, um, providing information on what excluded property is. For example, I would show your client the definition, which is at Family Law Act, Section 85, and it contains a list of excluded property. So providing that information could be valuable, but then telling someone whether or not their um, down payment in the house is still excluded, that's legal advice that a lawyer would have to address. Um, We'll talk about getting advice later on on these sorts of things, but for now, just the basic concepts. Yeah, so things that are normally excluded property, um, insurance proceeds, inheritance, gifts, um, and things acquired before the relationship. One of the last concepts I've got up here is valuing property. Um, So there's rules for how we do this in the Family Law Act. It's not theoretically just what people feel the property is worth. It is what the fair market value of the property is. Um, So this can be relatively simple for something like a house. You can get it appraised. That tells you what the sale value would be. For something like a corporation or someone's self-employed business, this can get quite complex. See another question? Yeah, when you say property value, like, you know, paper, uh, you know, you can get it a value today, but it's not going to be worth anything for Yeah, so this is where property law can get expensive and complicated. 
Um, so here, valuing property, the Family Law Act tells us that a property's value is fair market value on the date of either an agreement or final order dividing the property. So if you get a valuation of a home at the date of separation, if you don't have a trial for another two years, the value of that property can be really changed by the time that this has ended. So I um, don't have a lot of solutions or answers, but you're right, this is a problem and a complicated portion of dealing with property. Um, there are lots of different rules about, um, you know, some, some pieces of property will include um, that change in value. Other pieces of property, we may not include the change in value. So again, take away, things are complicated. Please, if your client has a complicated situation, try and get them legal advice. Um, I think that's everything from this slide. Okay, so we've got some basic definitions. The starting point in the Family Law Act is that upon separation, each party, so each spouse, is equally entitled to family property and equally responsible for family debt, regardless of their use or contribution. So that means even if one party is the only one uh, earning an income or paying the mortgage or doing something like that, typically the property would still be divided equally and the debt would still be divided equally. Um, there is an opportunity for unequal division. Uh, this is not the normal case. This would be an exception. Um, and the requirement is that equal division would be substantially unfair. So it's not just that it's unfair, it's that it is substantially unfair. The legislation does provide us a list of circumstances to consider um, for when something is substantially unfair. So you would consider, for example, the duration of the relationship, uh, any terms or agreements between the spouses other than written agreements, contributions to career and career potential, and reasons for incurring debt. Um, so for example, if one party has uh, made some really poor decisions and tanked the family's finances, there may be an argument for substantially, um, that the equal division would be substantially unfair and um, that could happen. Typically though, um, from a, a perspective of giving information to a client, equal division is the standard process. What we have here also is that excluded property is not typically divided um, because property law is complicated. Section 96 of the Family Law Act does provide some circumstances in which um, excluded property may be divided and included, but again, the standard process, excluded property is excluded and it is not divided. So the Family Law Act manages property division in a number of ways. So you can get orders that declare ownership, uh, that transfer ownership of specific assets from one party to another. Um, you can have a party being required to make an equalization payment. So if one party keeps $50 of assets and the other party keeps we're gonna see how bad I am at math, $20 of assets, then they would have to make a payment of like $15. I'm not gonna check my math there, but a payment to make sure from one party to the other that the balance of assets and debts is the same between parties. Um, the Family Law Act can also require that assets are sold and the proceeds are divided between the two parties in a way that creates an equal division of property. So we're running through this very quickly, um, but here I have a very basic overview of the Supreme Court process. Um, I know that, I also see a camera, we were late on our slides, they will be uploaded. I'm so sorry that we were not very organized, um, but they will be uploaded. Um, so here we have kind of a basic process on the right. So the first step in Supreme Court, similar to provincial court, is we'll have initiating documents. So one party will file what's called a notice of family claim, um, which is the document that lays out what they're asking for, both for the court and for the opposing party. Your notice of family claim will include a schedule for property. And typically when we're making uh, property, um, property claims, we'll also include the last schedule, which is schedule five. And that will have kind of the, the extra orders 
around how property is divided, protection of property, those sorts of things will be contained in that last schedule. Um, there's filing and service requirements, which are all laid out in Supreme Court family rules. And then the second party will typically file a counterclaim and response. And then we'll have an opportunity to, for the first party to file a counterclaim. Um, the second stage is disclosure and interim procedural issues. So here we'll get, for example, financial statements. Um, list of documents is something we don't have in provincial court and people often miss when they're in Supreme Court. Um, this is very important for financial claims. In brief, it's just a list of all of the documents your client has that are relevant to the litigation. Um, one of the important pieces of Supreme Court is we have a lot more rules about disclosure and those obligations. Um, which can be very challenging uh, if you're trying to wrangle someone into getting all of these steps met. Um, other pieces that are included in this disclosure stage are we'll have notice of applications and chambers hearings and judicial case conferences. Um, and these are all intended to make sure parties are prepared for trial, um, sometimes to protect assets before trial happens and to get everything organized and that nobody is surprised at trial with information that should have been disclosed earlier on. Finally, we have a trial and a decision. Um, this is moving along probably faster than any case in history. Um, and then finally, stage four, which I think we often forget, is enforcing the decision. Often I have clients who think that the judge said I get $30,000, therefore I will have $30,000. That's not how it works normally. You have to collect those $30,000 from the other party. So this stage can include collections, debt issues, um, leading property, that sort of stuff. One of the, um, one important point I think to managing clients' expectations is to be warning them about this stage before they get to the end of the process. Um, and probably a, a place for legal advice is advice on, you know, what is the cost of litigation? What are you going to see? And what is the reality of whether or not you're ever going to see that um, those, uh, whatever you're ordered in the end. Um, yeah, so one of the other things about Supreme Court process that I'll say is it's much more party driven. Provincial court, um, kind of the registry will book something and they'll contact you and things will get scheduled. In Supreme Court, that is all on the clients. The clients are obligated to file these documents, to remember to serve these documents. Um, a JCC is not booked for you. You have to file a notice of JCC, which is um, uh, a conference in front of a judge. That has to happen. But if neither party takes initiative to make it happen, uh, it doesn't. the process doesn't move along without them. The other piece that I would say, uh, similar to provincial court agreements um, and mediation can happen at any point in this process. Uh, in Supreme Court, there is a document called a notice to mediate, which can be filed by one party on another party and requires mediation to happen. Um, so not similar to provincial court, you have opportunities for off ramps through these mediative processes throughout the court proceeding. I just wanted to add a couple little pieces. One thing that often um, intimidates clients a lot about starting Supreme Court, um, if you were in our last presentation this morning, we talked about how um, clients often have to decide which level of court they're going into depending on what their issues are, um, which they should get legal advice on. Um, <laughs> So one thing that I often have with clients is they're like, I don't want to go to court. I want to have an agreement. I want to just go to mediation or whatever. But in situations where we're dealing with clients who are experiencing or have experienced family violence or are at risk of experiencing family violence, often mediation could be something um, that is not always the best fit. And so talking to them about what um, the options are with uh, going through Supreme Court versus mediation. Um, but then I've also had clients where Supreme Court is um, something that they think really triggers their ex and can increase violence that way. Um, so those are just things to think about and really emphasizing that if they do go the court route, that they can always opt out and um, go through um, a different process like um, coming up with a separation agreement or something. 
Um, another thing I just want to note about um, JCCs, which are judicial case conferences, um, before you uh, generally do any other hearing in Supreme Court, um, you have to attend a JCC, but you can get permission to either be released from the JCC program for the purpose of property um, or for another reason, but you do have to get permission from the court in order to do that. So I had one client where at the JCC, there was absolutely no way that the property was going to be dealt with. So the judge um, actually gave us permission and released us from the JCC program so that um, the client could put in a notice of application to force the sale of the home um, so that we didn't have to wait another three months for a JCC where the OP still wouldn't agree. Um, so just wanted to add that tidbit in. Yeah, the other um, piece with JCCs is you are able to um, bring applications that can be made on no notice uh, before the judicial case conference. So this would typically be protective sort of orders. So protection orders, for protection of person, but also uh, protection of property orders can be made beforehand. And we'll talk a bit more in detail about those later on. So one of the most important, or I would say the most important part of um, property law is financial disclosure. Um, when we're making agreements or orders, what we're trying to do is equally divide family property and debt. This is impossible if you do not know the value of family property or debt. Um, that being said, many people proceed on little to no information when they're making their orders or agreements. So financial disclosure can happen in a number of ways. Uh, there are requirements within the court process for how disclosure will happen, but there's also a lot of informal disclosure that may happen outside of the court process, uh, where people simply exchange their taxes or exchange their documents, and that's how they decide um, what the values are. Within the court process, we have a few um, standard disclosure pieces. So each party is required to provide a financial statement if they are um, filing an, a claim for property. Um, they're also required to provide a list of documents, which as we said, is a list of all of the documents about um, relevant to their claims. So that might include things like bank statements, um, uh, sales history of a car, um, yeah, financial statements, things that show value, those sorts of things. Um, and then we can also use the disclosure provisions in the Family Law Act to get extra documents. Um, there's a lot of more complicated rules around this, but for the purposes of today, um, I want to just briefly talk about Section 212, which allows the court to make orders for disclosure. Um, Often we'll see the court making orders for disclosure of things that people are required to disclose as a result of the rules. So you'll see um, an order requiring someone to update a financial statement or something like that, even though the rules already describe how that should happen. Um, but the reason you might want a 212 order is Section 213 allows the court to make orders enforcing disclosure. And this includes some fine provisions. Um, and there's a range of sanctions you can see at Section 213, um, but one of them is a $5,000 fine or being asked to pay the costs relating to disclosure. Um, another piece that's important to think about with financial disclosure is there are costs. I, I will get to you. Um, so, for example, if you're requesting that the other party provide a ton of documentation related to a business, um, you may be required to pay the cost of producing that documentation something to think about. Um, similar to if you're looking for police records, sometimes you're required to pay costs of producing them. I'm sorry, your question? Um, during a single application to the court, can you ask the judge to order, like for an order of disclosure and for an order enforcing the disclosure? Or would you have to do those at two separate applications? Um, I think that you could do them together. I think the circumstances in which a judge would order it would be rare. Um, so if you look at 213, there are some consequences that are financial. So like a fine, um, you're not likely to get a fine before the order has been breached, um, but you may get, um, I don't, there's one for like security of costs, I think. Um, and there's some like softer orders in there, which you may be able to get some leverage on. Um, the other important piece to note is 
if you're asking for an order saying that somebody has, if you're asking for an enforcement order, you need to be able to show that a breach has happened. So when you're asking for an order for disclosure under 212, it's important that you ask for a timeline with it. So for example, if someone is just told to disclose a document and there's no timeline, how do you know when it's been breached? If the timeline says within 15 days, this document must be disclosed, then on day 16, you can come in with your application. Yeah, thanks. Um, in terms of, okay, so enforcing disclosure, let's say they, I guess the question is, Okay, let's say they don't, and it's like a self-employed person. Um, the first question is, how do you do that? Uh, the second question is, in terms of this fine, like who do they pay? Do they actually pay the court or does it go to the other person? And do you have to apply for that? Like in terms of the fine itself? Yeah, so the fine provision, so there's, um, they're within 213. You, there's a range of ways that can happen. It can go to the person, it can go to the costs, it can go to the court. Um, as far as how you actually get these orders. If you're in Supreme Court, you would bring a notice of application. So this is um, uh, for chambers hearings. So this means not a trial, but those kind of interim or short paper applications. Um, so that means your evidence is by affidavit um, as opposed to in person. So um, yeah, you, you would bring a notice of application. You need to show why the documents you're asking for are relevant to the litigation. Um, so why do you need to have that financial statement of the self-employed person's business? It may be because uh, you're looking for spousal support. It may be because you're looking to divide the value of the business. Um, if you're looking for detailed supporting documents as opposed to just kind of the corporate statements, you may need to say why... Um, why there isn't enough information in the documents you have already. Um, so the, the process is you'd make a notice of application, which is a document saying what orders you're looking for and the legal basis. And then you would also include an affidavit explaining um, or providing the facts that give those reasons. Yes. Yeah. So what you're describing is problems with self-employed persons where there's perhaps uh, cash deals or um, issues with re the documents reflecting reality. So that, that's definitely a complicated problem. Um, I think in a moment, I'll have a slide showing my pet, not pet peeves, but things that make this very complicated. I'd suggest if you have those sorts of cases, um, I'm not gonna solve them now because there are problems. Uh, seek legal advice and then try and access some support for getting those notice of applications out for those clients. Um, so briefly, limitation periods uh, are important to talk about whenever we have legal cases. So um, for the division of property and debt, your basic limitation period is two years after the date of separation for married spouse or for non-married spouses or two years after the date of divorce or annulment for married spouses. Um, that being said, limitation periods can be complicated. Um, it's always important to get legal advice on that. And even if the limitation period has not run out, it can be important to divide property. So for example, one of the things I see is people separate, um, they're still married, so their limitation clock um, hasn't started, um, but they have done nothing to divide property. 10 years later, they would now like a portion of the RSP because their spouse is about to, um, or their separated spouse is probably going to be able to access that money for retirement soon. Then you run into a lot of problems. You run into problems with the value of the items to be divided. Um, because as we said earlier, the value is the date of agreement or order, not the date of separation. Um, you run into problems finding documents. It turns out banks don't keep records forever. So it's really challenging to describe what the value of something is. Um, you have increased likelihood that the assets will have just disappeared in the meantime. Um, 
and a whole range of problems. So in a perfect world, I'd say most property divisions should be dealt with as close to the date of separation as possible. Um, for reasons we will discuss later, this doesn't always happen because property division is very complex and there's not a lot of support. Um, but I would, again, this goes into legal advice, so probably something the client should speak to a lawyer about, but typically, um, there's a lot of risk to waiting to the end of your limitation period to address a property claim. So um, as we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of complicated issues that come up in uh, property division. Here's just a list of some of my least favorite ones. Um, so excluded property commingled with family property. We touched on that earlier. Um, so using an inheritance to buy a house that's then in both parties' name, what happens to the inheritance? Can we prove it existed? Is there, um, yeah, so that becomes a problem. Uh, Self-employed persons and corporations, for the reasons just described, um, there's a lot of complicated documents. Often people will write things off against their business, so their income is not actually reflective of what their income is. Things get very complicated. Um, when there are more than two parties, this is coming up more and more. So if you, um, if one spouse owns a property with their family, uh, that can create complicated issues at the division of property time. Um, if there's an incomplete previous separation, so someone remarries before dealing with their property issues, um, and then there's lots of people claiming <laughs> the property that exists. Um, pensions, as I said, they get very expensive very quickly. Um, and they have a lot of lawyer insurance claims. So where lawyers have made mistakes have to do with pensions. So I would caution you to try not to deal with pensions where possible. Um, significant financial imbalance between spouses is something that I think advocates come across a lot. So when one party has all of the assets and all of the income and is able to hire a lawyer to manage the case, to bring lots of applications, and the other party is um, self-represented with the support of an advocate, you can have, um, that can get very complicated. And then property in multiple jurisdictions. So um, it may be as simple as someone owns a house in, um, Alberta. Uh, we have a lot of kind of British Columbia, Alberta families. This can get complicated, for example, because there's different rules in Alberta. You can also have um, multi-jurisdictional, so outside of Canada. Um, again, things get complicated. So in all of these circumstances, um, you do not have to solve this problem. I can't solve half of these problems, but they're good things to flag if your client is going for legal advice make sure the legal advice lawyer knows that these issues exist um, and try and get them to give advice to your client on them. And I think one other thing I just wanted to add with this that's complicated and a situation that I'm dealing with now um, is that the opposing party was trying to transfer the title of the house into his parents' name, um, which adds a whole nother thing, or in that same case where his parents transferred him a million dollars to just buy a house outright, um, which is wild. Um, but yeah. So we kind of wanted to talk about who can do what, because um, for a lot of uh, law foundation funded advocates, um, you might be limited in what you can do in terms of dealing with property. Um, so we want to talk about scopes of service and then how my role is different and what I can do um, to assist and then um, lawyers and their limitations as well. Um, just for anyone who isn't familiar with what my role is and what um, I'm able to do, um, I'm the virtual legal advocate at RISE. So I'm based out of the Vancouver office. Um, but I don't help clients in the lower mainland. I only help clients that are outside of the lower mainland. Um, so all around the province and I have to be in BC, um, or at least their legal matter has to be in BC. I can help clients who are living elsewhere in some situations. Um, and the idea of this role was to help uh, bridge the gap for clients who don't have advocates in their area at all. There are some regions that have no advocates or only have maybe one advocate. Um, so the idea was that I could try and fill that gap. Um, other things that this role is meant to fill in is if any of you go on vacation 
or if you have to go on leave, the idea is, is that it's possible that I can take on your clients. Obviously, I am not making a promise there. Um, we had one advocate who left and my pro- our program assistant, Harpreet, called me and was like, uh, do you have capacity for eight new clients today? And I was like, not really, but okay. Um, so we will obviously navigate that as things come up. Um, but also um, a great part of my uh, role is that I can take on things that um, other advocates can't. I can take on higher property, which we'll talk about, and I can do separation agreements. So these are just general things that um, Law Foundation advocates can do. A lot of you already know this, so I'll just like quickly whiz through it. Um, you can fill out court forms and applications, court registry advocacy, which is a obviously huge part of our roles in a lot of uh, different areas. Supporting clients through mediation, uh, the virtual family mediation program at Access Pro Bono will let advocates um, support clients, which is really, really great. Um, I have also recently found out that in certain situations, if a client already has a legal aid lawyer and the client chooses to go through the virtual family mediation program, there are some exceptions that can be made where instead of having a different lawyer providing the independent legal advice for mediation, they can continue to work with their legal aid lawyer. You do have to get special permission, um, but that is an option if a client doesn't want to have to end the contract. Um, In addition to that, though, legal aid uh, generally is meant to cover the half of the client's um, costs for mediation. So if they do have a legal aid lawyer, they choose to go through mediation, legal aid should cover the cost of the mediator for the client. Um, Assisting uh, clients with preparing for and participating in summary advice appointments, which was a bit of what our presentation um, earlier this morning was about. Referring clients to other supports and organizations. um, Helping clients implement legal advice. Supporting clients working with legal aid lawyers, which we're going to get into a bit more. Legal aid applications, change of counsel forms, eligibility reviews. For anyone who doesn't know, an eligibility review is basically a fancy way of saying appealing a legal aid refusal. Um, My favorite thing to do. Um, And supporting clients in court appearances and hearings. So my role is a bit different um, because I'm able to draft separation agreements. To the best of my knowledge, no other family law advocate in BC is allowed to do this. Um, I work really, really closely with my supervising lawyer. I have access to her seven and a half hours a day um, and to um, Rosanna and Gabrielle, our summary advice service lawyers. Um, And so we have done a few separation agreements. We've reviewed quite a few separation agreements. So if you do have clients who are wanting to pursue this um, or who already have one drafted and need advice on it, you can refer them to us and I can support them. Um, supporting clients with implementing legal advice on property division. I'm insured up to a million for um, property. As far as I know, the average is about 20,000 for other advocates. So that's obviously a significant difference. Um, And obviously in times like these where property is generally worth a lot more, um, it's helpful for me to be able to help with um, amounts this high. Obviously this is um, in terms of equity. Um, So a lot of clients, at least that I have, their equity is not a million dollars. Maybe it might be something more like 200,000 or something, but that's still above the um, threshold for a lot of advocates. So that's been um, really, really helpful uh, for clients with property division. Another key thing about RISE is you might wonder, okay, well, how is somebody eligible for our services if they have that much equity in property? We don't include family property in our assessment for um, a client accessing our services because of the exact reason that they can't access the equity because it's tied up in family um, litigation. So um, what do you do in a situation where you have a client where they have more than $20,000 in assets and you aren't allowed to help them because you're not insured to? Um, you can, like I said, refer them to RISE. Um, even if you are in the lower mainland, you can still refer clients to RISE. Um, they might not, or they won't be eligible for our student clinic because they don't do Supreme Court. And like we just said, Supreme Court is where uh, property generally happens, um, but they can still access summary advice. Um, Access Pro Bono has several options. Uh, The Virtual Family Mediation Project is a really great resource. I have a lot of success referring clients to them. I generally do a warm referral. So if you want to talk about how to do a warm referral to this program, let me know. Um, They also have their lawyer referral service. Um, 
This one can be a bit harder uh, because the idea is, is that they have um, the 30 minutes of uh, free summary advice. And then um, the idea is, is that you'd be connected to stay with that lawyer if they'll take on the file pro bono. Um, very rare. Um, they also have the roster program um, where you can email uh, APB, um, specifically Heather Wojcik, and provide sort of like a rundown of what the client situation is. Uh, generally, I would provide the conflict information as well. And then what Heather does is send this sends this um, summary of the client's issue out to uh, the lawyers on the roster, and then they can choose if they want to represent the client pro bono. If you do that um, and a client has a pro bono lawyer, they can also get up to $2,500 in disbursement coverage. Um, so they do offer that. If you want more information about it, you do have to apply for it, but it's pretty straightforward. And then they have their summary advice program where you get 30 minutes of free advice. They also have their Everyone Legal Clinic that's new. I'm not going to speak to that today. Contact them if you have questions. I have a lot of questions still. So, um, and then legal aid, which I'll kind of get into a little bit more, um, but they do um, cover some property division, which I'll talk about. And then unbundled legal services. Uh, one really helpful thing um, when clients do have property is. Um, Sometimes, and again, this is not super common, um, a lawyer could take on a file and then they would get paid after a, a property settlement comes um, to the client. Again, not super common. It's case by case basis, but it is possible. Um, in addition to that, too, if a client is able to get an interim distribution of property uh, to be able to pay for counsel, unbundled services are a good option because it's less expensive. Uh, for example, the average hourly wage for or hourly um, billing cost for a lawyer would be about three hundred and fifty dollars um, an hour. But unbundled legal services, you can negotiate that and lower the amounts. Um, also, just for everyone's uh, knowledge, we have um, two incubator lawyers at Rise right now um, who are former students at RISE who are starting their own firm and have lower rates right now um, as they're trying to build their caseload. Um, and they will take clients uh, that are not just in the lower mainland and they're doing unbundled services. Um, so it's Jalel and Valeska. So reach out to us if you are interested in connecting with them. They are also taking legal aid. Um, so that's good to know since that's hard to find right now. Um, any questions? Yeah. Here, I might give you this. Um, okay. So you mentioned um, separation agreements. Um, in terms of drafting them, um, I find when people are working on separation agreements, it can be a process of negotiation of back and forth drafting. So, you know, one person will draft the separation agreement, it'll go to the other side. And of course, that person, you know, if they're paid having a lawyer, um, who advises them, they were like, okay, these things look good, these things don't look good. And then they end up like writing a letter to the first lawyer who drafted it and saying like, change all these things and then we'll sign it. And of course the first lawyer who looked at it will be like, okay, like, sure. Like they will redraft it, but of course not to the opposing counsel's exact wording because opposing counsel's first wording uh, favors like, you know, the opposing party. So in like when you draft them, like, are you open to drafting and redrafting these agreements? Yeah, that kind of um, comes with it naturally. What we've done before is draft like an offer letter and then it goes back and forth as an offer letter instead of like an actual agreement that has like the space for the signature and everything. Um, and then the negotiations still happen between the client and the other party. It's not us and then they have to forward me the email. It's chaotic, but it is what it is. Um, Honestly, I haven't had a situation where much back and forth has happened, knock on wood. Um, it's been like change this line and this line. Um, so it hasn't been super complicated, thankfully. Um, there's a little bit that I will get into later about this as well. But um, yeah, we will go back and forth. Um, we use Divorce Mate to draft them, which everybody should or can use Divorce Mate if you're Law Foundation funded. Um, Maggie, I think, is training people on it. Um, so it's really helpful, um, but yeah, the back and forth is fine and expected. Yeah. No, that's okay. Um, 
All right. So the other one talked about, um, you know, you said you had a million dollar limit for property division. Uh, we had a workaround for this, but not a very good workaround in the terms that when we were helping clients who had very unequal wealth and we're helping the one who's very disadvantaged, um, sometimes we help them apply for interim distribution, but only up to $20,000 because that's our property division max. Um, so I guess like, do you do interim distribution or, you know, if we were to help with interim distribution where they get $20,000, do you find that clients would be able to get a lawyer, hire them and pay them to perhaps get a higher amount later on because they just had no money to begin with. So they couldn't hire a lawyer in the first place. So we would be able to help with interim distribution through several programs in RISE. So I know that I would be able to as a summary advice lawyer. Um, I think that my counterpart, Gabrielle, is putting or putting together some document or uh, public legal education specifically about interim distributions and getting them. Um, for $20,000, you could probably get a lawyer on board. Um, one of, and I suspect, I hadn't thought about this before, but I think you could then go back for a second interim distribution. Um, it's not a particularly effective use of court time, um, but it's, it's an option to get a second interim distribution. Um, I think judges would be very confused by why you're coming back a second time, but it is what it is. Uh, so I think that's, a significantly better option for a client than simply not having an interim distribution if you're able to get that amount. And um, yeah, I think like retainers for lawyers, you're, you're going to need like several thousand dollars. Um, I don't think many people, unless there's a trial date set right away, will need the 20. Yeah. So occasionally I end up with these clients who have consulted with a lawyer for like half an hour or something. And they're saying, your case looks like it's going to, like, I'm going to need a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. And all we can get is 20. So I'm like, you know, like, what do they do after 20? Like, so they, they got a lawyer on board and they're like, this is not enough though. So what will happen is um, they will pay their lawyer and run out of money and still not have resolved their case. Yep. Yeah. Um, so this is, this is one of the problems with property division is it's in fact really expensive to get money back. Um, I do not have a great solution for this problem today. It's, I think, free legal representation, um, but we don't have that. Um, one of the other pieces that kind of falls within this complication about clients who do not have a lot of resources is, for example, if you have a legal aid contract for part of your um, part of your case, that lawyer is obligated to tell legal aid if you get a settlement and then claw back a portion of that settlement to cover your costs. So there are many circumstances where a client can get to the end and then realize they're actually going to be out of pocket because either court costs, having to pay back legal aid, um, you know, they put so much of their interim distribution out to a lawyer that there is nothing really left at the end. So these are important um, discussions to have with legal advice at the beginning. Um, but yeah, if you're if if you have a lawyer in mind for a client, um, and you're only able to do a twenty thousand dollar inch term distribution, and that lawyer is saying we actually need this much money, um, there's a range of things you might be able to do. But I would say advocacy with that lawyer, seeing um, if there's any work you can do as an advocate within your role. Um, so without going over your twenty thousand dollars, maybe you help the client draft everything. Um, but then you just leave them the Word documents and they go to that lawyer and that lawyer plugs in the right number. I don't know if that's Law Foundation uh, approved, but like some sort of advocacy with that lawyer. Because, you know, if the money is there, if someone is able to do some of the work, that lawyer may come in and say, well, I'm happy to do a little bit of work prospectively. Um, if it means that <laughs> this client's going to pay me $100,000 in the end. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's it's definitely an important discussion to have with a client, the reality of the costs of these cases. The other thing I would add is like, you can refer them to RISE if you need to. And like, if that higher 
insurance number is going to be able to help, then like that's something that we can take into account for sure. Um, any other? Yeah. Um, so in the past, I've done some negotiating training and generally the idea was uh, not related to this. So it's previous lifetime. So the question, normally the, the advice is let the other person make the first offer. Obviously it's difficult to force the OP to, to make an offer. If you're putting something on the table, do you put down a fair 50, 50 split as you see it, or do you put down um, a somewhat more aggressive first offer so that they have room to negotiate back and forth a bit. So this is another example of a question that I'm not going to be able to give a straight answer to because it depends on the case. Um, when I was in private practice, like I don't really like engaging in the nonsense. So I'm like, this is what a court will order. Like, let us just do it. Um, depending on the lawyer you're dealing with, the sort of person on the other side, um, what your client's position is, there can be a lot of room kind of to take different approaches. Um, often what I find is that clients uh, have particular goals that are not necessarily fair division or sorry, division in line with the Family Law Act. So it, keeping the property or something like that, and they're willing to make compromises to make that happen. Um, I think there's limits within, and we'll talk about this, we'll probably skip it later, but um, it, you as an advocate or me as a lawyer, um, there are limits to how far we can go with our client away from what's in the Family Law Act. Um, so there, there are places, for example, if a client wants to sign an agreement without financial disclosure, I am not going to be part of that, unfortunately, because it's, it's not a legal agreement at that point. It's just, you know, what, what they're doing. It's, it has no basis in the Family Law Act. Um, if a client is giving up um, the majority of their claims, then also there's places where you may have to back out. Um, if a client is asking for something that is so um, far from in line with the Family Law Act, so they're asking for all of the property and there's no reason why, um, no connection to um, the criteria for substantial unfairness within the Family Law Act, then you would probably say, or my position to that client would be, this isn't something I can support you with. Um, because you're not asking for a lawyer, you're asking to just do kind of what you feel is right. Um, that being said, lots of wiggle room. It depends on the client, the other party, the other lawyer, and kind of the, the way the case has gone forward. A classic, it depends answer from a lawyer. Um, so in terms of um, getting a client help from legal aid uh, for property, for a long time, it wasn't super clear um, that you could just apply for a limited representation contract for property alone. We didn't actually get that confirmed at RISE until like a couple months ago. Um, so I wanted to make sure that everybody knows that you can do that. Um, you can put in an application for limited rep um, just on property division. Um, limited rep uh, means that you get eight hours generally of general prep time. And then there's also um, a few hours for court as well. Um, so yeah, yep, Zoe. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, so I'm still in private practice uh, in addition to working with RISE. I am one of the very few lawyers that will take these files because they suck. And the reason they suck is because what can you get done in eight hours on a Supreme Court file? By the time that you review the documents, review the disclosure, interview your client, make sure that you have the proper disclosure. Um, I think the most I've ever done on one of these files is I've, 
um, done all of those steps, plus drafted a notice of application, supporting affidavit for property preservation, coached the client on to self represent, uh, how to self-represent at that hearing, at that chamber's hearing. And I was way over the eight hours and I was working for free by about halfway through that. So it's not very attractive um, to lawyers, which is why it's so important that we pair up lawyers with advocates because my life is so much easier when I have an advocate who is capable and willing to work alongside me. So really fostering those relationships in the community with lawyers is what's I think going to augment um, these contracts to a point where it's actually worth doing them for lawyers. Well, the, the good news around that is that they actually announced the other day while we were all here that uh, they're doing a review of both the hours and the time limitations for the uh, limited rep contracts. So hopefully those both get extended so that it will be more appealing to lawyers because no lawyer wants to step onto something that they won't be able to at least have some level of completion on and just feels like a waste of time. Um, I've had the experience when, um, when I call into the call center with clients for property issues, the intake worker will straight up say that property is not covered. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any tips for um, advocating for the client when there is that firm response. Kirk won't like me saying this, but I would email Kirk because um, that like I asked that question in the session the other day because that's happened to me before too. I straight up said, should I be saying specifically that it's for limited rep that's supposed to cover property? And they were like, oh no, when you apply, they should be always assessing for the highest amount of representation. And then from there, it'll go down until they hit what they can cover. So email Kirk. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> My um, supervising lawyer um, kind of gives me a bit of a pushback when I talk unbundled services with other lawyers and uh, complains that they're treating me like a legal secretary and I shouldn't be uh, standing for that. Any advice? I'm concrete thinker. I'm not very, uh, you know. Honestly, I personally, I take the approach of like, it's increasing access to justice for the clients. And like my main goal when assisting a legal aid lawyer with a file is that I just don't want to have to see my client sitting in court panicked about asking to force a sale of the home and crying because she doesn't understand what's going on. So when I'm working with legal aid lawyers, which I do a lot, I take the perspective that it's client centered and that I'm helping, yes, ease the load of the legal aid lawyer, but the focus is the client. Like I, I'm drafting documents, whether they have a legal aid lawyer or not, it's just a matter of who's supervising that document now, right? Like it's the same as my supervising lawyer, Vicky, doing it as it is like Agnes Wong from her law firm reviewing the documents and representing the client in court. Um, and say it's making less work for your supervising lawyer. Like I just, that's how I, when I call a legal aid lawyer, I'm like, this is less work for you. Can we do this? And they're like, oh, great. Less work for me. Sure. And then same thing for um, on the flip side of it. I mean, at Rise, it's a huge thing that I do is to maximize the hours. Um, but um, in terms of um, getting the, the contract, they, they're supposed to be assessing for it. And we have explicit, an explicit statement saying that limited rep, yeah, exactly, um, should cover property. Um, what I did ask is for a standard contract, it is not considered, um, a coverable issue. However, um, if all the coverable issues are dealt with, which I doubt ever happens, um, before they run out of hours, then they can make the decision based on their own discretion if they're going to deal with property. Um, so that's another thing to think about. If you have a client who still needs property dealt with and the legal aid lawyer can't do it and you can't do it, you can refer them to us. I know that I shouldn't keep saying that, but like, I know we're kind of like the only option. <laughs> um, so kind of pivoting, if there aren't any other questions, I uh, wanted to talk about um, what we can do um, to support clients, even maybe before you send them off so that you're not going above that $20,000 um, 
uh, limit. Um, I don't know what the Law Foundation's official stance is on it, um, but it might be something to think about. Um, is honestly the collection of documents is one of the most challenging parts of this job. Um, even just getting like a piece of ID from people can feel impossible. Um, so these are some of the things that you'd want to gather uh, to help prepare for financial disclosure for a client. Um, and so bank accounts, this can be really difficult to get from clients, especially when they send you like photos of their bank account and then email you like 50 photos of them scrolling through. It's we love when that happens. We actually have a document at Rise that teaches people how to download PDFs from their banks. Um, so if anybody needs that, let us know. Um, so um, both the joint and personal accounts can be important uh, to provide um, understanding what their debts are. I have a client who doesn't even remember what some of her debts are and how to figure out what they are because they're from like 10 years ago. Um, so honestly, a big piece of what I'm doing that so that her legal aid lawyer doesn't have to worry about it is helping her figure that stuff out. Um, three most recent years of tax returns and notice of assessments. Surprising number of clients also don't have access to this and they've never even tried logging into my CRA. So helping people with that can be so, so beneficial. Um, there are some tax clinics around the province as well that people can utilize. If you need more info about that, let us know. Um, preparing financial statements. I do this even if clients are not going to court. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this, but mostly it's a succinct little document, not little document, um, where all the things that you need to disclose are on there. So even if it's not going to have to get filed in Supreme Court, it can be so helpful. Um, they are really, 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 really invasive and really uncomfortable to do a lot of the time. It asks for details all the way down to like, how much money do you spend on your hair each month? Um, so it can be really uncomfortable for clients. Another thing I like to highlight with this though is... Um, to be as honest as possible, a lot of, at least my clients, women are minimizing um, the amount of money that they actually spend on these things, but it's so important to be super accurate. So that's something I like to highlight. Sarah, you had your hand up. With regard to the um, financial statement, even if you're doing like say an access pro bono uh, family mediation project, they do state that like financial disclosure is required. And the first time I was doing it, I thought they had their own process, but then lo and behold, once the appointment was scheduled, they did want sworn F8s. And there was like this scramble by the two parties to try and provide that. So it's better to just like start working on that right away. And Divorce Mate um, has uh, the ability to calculate the numbers. Who had their hand up? You, um, Which is really helpful um, so that you don't have to use a calculator. <laughs> I actually enjoy doing the financial statements. Absolutely, because it, it, it can be transformative for the clients. Holy smokes, I spent this much on cigarettes and booze last year. And, you know, they make positive changes in their lives, right? It's fantastic. Um, yeah, so the other thing I wanted to say, and like a good strategy that I've figured out after many failed... Okay. Um, like with dealing with uh, financial statements um, is I've started just like, I have an ongoing document and my email drafts where it's all the numbers that I need. I just copy and paste it into an email so that a client can just add in the numbers in like red font or something and send it to me on their own time. Sending clients a Supreme Court document can sometimes be really intimidating. They don't know how to fill them out. I've had some really weird stuff come back to me. So I realized, okay, if I just send these numbers, I, I need your rent, I need how much you spend on this and let them fill it out on their own time. That can be really helpful. Um, this will all be posted, um, but collecting addresses and PID numbers um, for property, um, all those different things. Um, if they own their own business, getting all the information about that is really important as well. Um, assets and debts need to be listed. Um, and sometimes I will ask clients to come with ideas of what they do want out of it. I always say, what's your dream scenario? I'm not saying that this is what's going to happen, but what's your dream situation as a sort of a starting point before getting legal advice. Um, this was in the earlier presentation, but just really quickly, when you have a client who might be self-representing in court regarding property, providing them with a script that is reviewed by a lawyer can be really, really helpful. Um, and providing them with a brief um, Docu a document with that briefly lists um, and highlights important dates and numbers and explanations for things as well. 
Uh, I think we've we talked about this a bit earlier. Um, so one of the big problems I come across, and I think many people come across with property, is we don't have. Um, often clients are seeking to enter agreements that are not in their best interest, that are not in line with the Family Law Act, or that don't have financial disclosure. Um, so we have taken more time than we expected, so we're not going to have a discussion. Um, but if that sort of situation comes up, please speak to your supervising lawyer. Um, you are not obligated to, or often you can't help a client enter into an agreement that is not in their interest. Um, and there's specific steps you should take if that comes up. Does anybody know when the session ends? Excellent. Oh, we have plenty of time. Huh. Um, so on this slide, I'm going to tell you what lawyers can't do. So uh, we've talked a lot about the limits of lawyers' help on these files. Um, so there is the problem of getting a lawyer who will take a file for little to no pay. Um, there's also problems if you do have a lawyer with the sort of advice they're able to provide. So summary advice services are often hesitant to give legal advice because they don't have the financial information. Um, so it's hard for them to say this, you know, this is what's a fair deal because they don't know what that disclosure piece is. Um, there's also often problems within their programs. So we do offer uh, property advice within our program at RISE. I've spoken to other people in summary advice services. Well, they'll provide primarily information about property division, but they're not going to provide any application to a client's case. Um, we also have insurance limits. So for example, at RISE, for me, I have an insurance limit. Um, several times it has come up where I've been unable to help clients because of it. Um, and then we've also touched on legal aid certificate issues, so limited rep contracts, and then also the problem of property not being a primary issue, primary coverable issue on a certificate. Um, yeah, so lawyers are not a perfect solution. The other piece is other professionals. So um, legal advice is great, but you also may need to get financial advice. A client may need to know how much money they need to get a mortgage if they're going to buy someone out of a property. Um, there is no point in like discussing a buyout if it's not financially possible. Um, business appraisals, property appraisals, these are all things that may have to happen. Um, these are all non-lawyer specialists that you could get involved. Um, and then pension plan administrators are another big one um, that people often have to contact. Um, so in half an hour, I'm going to try in half an hour, 15 minutes going through protection of assets. Um, this was supposed to be quite a quick overview. There is another presentation from last year that provides a lot more detail on CPLs, so Certificate of Pending Litigation, Land Spouse Protection Act entries, and I think Section 91 orders. Um, so if I don't get through everything, uh, I will refer you to that. So um, Certificate of Pending Litigations are used to protect property. Um, they're used to protect real estate. Um, by giving notice to a prospective buyer or lender, so a mortgage, that the property is subject to a claim. You can find these in all sorts of uh, litigation processes, but they're common in family law. So um, the process to get one in a family case is on your notice of family claim, so that originating document. Um, you would claim an interest in the property, so you would say one of the one of the pieces of property we're asking to divide as family property is this home. You'd include it on the form and then you'd file a few other documents. Um, some of them go to the land tiles office and some of them go to the court registry. Um, there's more information in that PowerPoint that I was talking about, which is linked in this slide. Um, but the important thing to note about a certificate of pending litigation is you can get it um, prior to giving notice to the other party that you are beginning litigation. So if it's on your notice of family claim, uh, you file the notice of family claim with the court attaching the certificate of pending litigation documents. And before you file that notice of family claim, your client um, would then go to the land titles office, there's a process, um, 
and make sure that entry is made on title, preventing the, um, the, the sale or the mortgaging of the property. So the idea is this way, the opposing party is unable to reduce the value of the property to sell it or in other ways, kind of get rid of your client's claim. Um, if you have a certificate of pending litigation issue, it is something that RISE is able to assist with. Um, the land titles office can be challenging to deal with. So uh, we have access to their online forms. So the question was the cost for a certificate certificate of pending litigation. I believe the entry is like for $40 or something like that. Um, but you also have the notice of family claim cost, which is 200. And then you may have to have a requisition for the form 33. Um, so you're engaging with Supreme Court costs uh, or uh, filing fees. There are, um, you can ask for a waiver of Supreme Court filing fees through another long and complicated form that involves a lot of financial disclosure, um, but that wouldn't apply to the land titles office cost, um, but unfortunately a cost of engaging with property. Um, for clients that are accessing RISE, um, if they're super low income and they have really challenging financial situations, we can uh, request that those fees get covered. Obviously, that is not for every client. And I'm only saying that if you have a client that's like in a really, really difficult situation, um, we can sometimes cover those costs. So the next piece we're talking about is Land Spouse Protection Act entries. So these are very similar to um, the CPL. But the difference is a Land Spouse Protection Act entry um, requires that the person who's asking for the entry does not actually have um, like a, an interest on titles. So they're not uh, an owner of the property. If you were to look at the property title, their name would not be on it, but that they have lived in it um, within a year of asking for the entry. So in the Land Spouse Protection Act, this is called a homestead. So it's a home where only one spouse is on um, and they've used as their residence within the last year. Um, one of the interesting thing about a Land Spouse Protection Act entry is you are not required to have filed a notice of family claims. So you don't have to start a legal case to make an entry. You don't actually have had to have left the family home. So um, you can file this entry without giving any notice to the opposing party. So there is no, um, uh, there's no document that's sent to them saying, hey, an entry has been made on your title. If that person were to go look at the land titles office um, and search for the title of their home, they would see this entry on it. But the Land Spouse Protection Act entry process doesn't require any notice to the other party and can be made before they have separated. Um, I think that's all I have to say about that. You have any? No. So section 91 orders are what we call financial restraining orders. You might hear it being called a freezing order. Um, so it can, similar to the CPL, the property has to be claimed in the notice of family claim. So it has to be um, a piece of property that we're asking to be divided between the two spouses or for one spouse to get, but it has to be claimed as family property. Um, there's a range of orders that you can ask for under section 91. For example, um, the standard language says something like, party A is prevented from disposing of, transferring, converting, or exchanging into any other form the property. Um, you can also ask for an order specifically freezing the property. And then once you have these orders, you can send it to the institution that um, has the piece of property and they will prevent it from being used um, and they can be made without notice. So um, do you at RISE have the ability to also remove CPLs and unfreeze assets? I know we don't, like we can freeze, but we can't unfreeze, so. So that would be very case specific. Um, the test for removing a CPL is in um, 
in case law, um, I'm trying to think of a circumstance where we would do it. Um, but yeah, my understanding is there's no bar on it, but you would, it would be a case specific. So if you have a client that might do it, then please let us know. And no one's told me I can't. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you're going to talk about this, but I'm wondering what legal test needs to be met to get a section 91. Um, so off the top of my head, uh, the section 91, I think you have to show that there is in fact a risk that the asset will be used um, in a way uh, that's going to defeat your claim to the property. So if, if someone says, hey, I'm going to, your client's ex says, well, I'm just going to uh, sell the boat and then you can't have it, ha ha ha, then like that meets the grounds. There's uh, a significant asset that will be sold. Um, if the boat disappears, then we can't access fair division. Um, that is probably not the exact wording of the legal test, uh, but basically, <laughs> is there an asset? Is it claimed in the notice of family claim? So is it potentially family property? Um, and will has there been some indication that it's likely to be um, disposed of or converted or sold? And then am I missing? The bar is really low. Bar is very low. The bar is really low. Because so, judges do not go on to the judge's order. They don't get a section 91 and then prove the law. So despite what Maggie has just said about the bar being really low, I've had self-reps come back to me afterwards and say they were yelled at by a judge for asking for a section 91 order. Yeah, I know. Um, so the bar is low. I've never had one refused, but if you're, um, yeah, we'll see how they Yeah, so this is what I've referred to. So Patrick, Grayer has a great presentation on these three pieces. Um, it's last year's training materials. Here's the link. Um, and then one of the things that's really great in it is it's got um, an example email or letter to a bank or institution um, that you could sell if you were freezing, sell, that you could use, replace parts of it um, if you were to ask to freeze an asset. Um, so section 89 or the interim distribution of property, uh, we have already talked about why you might want that. Um, the interim distribution can't be used for just anything. It has to be used either to hire a lawyer, to participate in family dispute resolution, or to obtain information and evidence required for family dispute resolution. So um, basically it needs to be used for the case. and. You have to show when you're asking the judge for these distributions that um, there's a need um, for there to be an interim distribution to level the playing field. Um, the process one would use is a notice of application and the test um, is that you need to show that the advance is required to challenge the other spouse's position and that the advance will not jeopardize the other spouse's position at trial. So if there is only $100,000 of assets to be distributed, yeah, and you ask for all of that amount to be distributed, you might run into a problem there. Is it possible um, to get in Section 89 order for, like, say, the clients at risk of, like, being homeless or something to pay for living costs or something? Yeah, so um, there is what actually happens in, in court and what's supposed to happen. So that's not technically an interim distribution. Um, I can see making arguments that someone's unable to participate in family dispute resolution if they're homeless or something like that. Um, but what you've described is probably an interim spousal support claim. Um, so is it possible to get an interim distribution to use in that manner? I'm sure it has happened. Is it the proper way to advance that claim? Probably not. Uh, probably a spousal support claim. Anybody? Question? Yes. I don't know. Go answer the question. Just a five-minute warning.
I'm not sure if it was mentioned, but I just wanted to say that you can apply for a fee waiver as well in Supreme Court. So the fee waiver forms are unfortunately complicated. They do look almost identical to a financial statement last time I looked at them. Um, back to what Rosanna was saying about what happens in court and what should happen. Um, I have seen interim distribution of a dog before. Um, <laughs> And the reason that the judge did this was because, and, and very like, very much manipulated the language of the Family Law Act to make this work. But he said it was in the spirit of family dis dispute resolution to remove this high, um, high value item off the table on an interim without prejudice basis, um, so that they'd stop fighting and it would stay at a court for at least another month. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what to say about that. Um, we also, the other place I see interim distributions a lot is to fund like a Section 211 report or something like that, or to fund uh, appraisals or business, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Sam has asked me if it could be used to cover the cost of an expert witness. I'm going to say if it can be used to distribute a dog, the sky is the limit. Um, yeah. Those are our emails. As I've said, we will provide the slide deck to um, the online thing soon. Sorry, we didn't do it in advance. Uh, no, that's everything. Did we have any online questions? No. No. Okay. Any other questions or we can set you free from the excitement of property division? 